Hello, everyone. Uh, glad to glad to have you here. Um, I'm not sure how many are actually attending live. We had a little bit of a mix-up this morning. Uh, intended to uh, have this uh, at 11 o'clock this morning and had some difficulty trying to get YouTube Live to work, but uh, I think I understand how that uh, can now uh, be used to share some slides. And it's important to see the slides because uh, a lot of the information that I have today is is uh, based on some uh, visual information um, that's difficult to present without the uh, without the slides to go along with it. So uh, this, this webinar is the second one for uh, the Deep Reinforcement Learning uh, class that we're, we're holding this uh, semester. I guess it's a semester. It takes the next three to four months. And uh, I'm glad that you're all here. Um, this first one is really an introduction to deep reinforcement learning. And uh, I'll just uh, present the slides now. And, and just a second, pull up the share window here. OK, I hope everyone can see uh, the window. And I'm going to back this up to the beginning. Okay, you just got a big overview of the whole process here. So um, today's presentation, it's uh, the introduction to deep reinforcement learning and really the most important uh, concept of all in all of deep RL is probably the Markov decision process. And so we'll, we'll go through the model for how uh, Markov decision processes relate to everything we'll do in this, in this course. So a couple objectives here. Uh, the first one is just to give a feel for where Deep reinforcement lies um, in the general AI landscape where the different types of uh, machine learning uh, and, and where uh, deep reinforcement uh, lives in that uh, general landscape. Uh, as I said, the Markov decision process is super important for deep reinforcement learning, so we'll spend some time talking about that. And as we'll see, uh, the MDP processes include uh, an agent, an environment, the reward states, and actions that, uh, that you can have in the environment and the interaction with the agent. As an example uh, of this process, I'll discuss a kind of a, a very introductory uh, example called the multi-arm bandit, and uh, we'll see how that works. So where does reinforcement learning lie in the overall machine learning landscape? I thought this was an interesting uh, picture. Uh, this, is, this is from Towards Data Science. It's an online blog about data science and machine learning. Uh, it kind of gives a really good overview of of all of machine learning. And you can see on the right-hand side a uh, couple areas that I think that uh, most of us are most familiar with probably, and that's supervised learning, uh, using a neural network, for example, to classify images, detect fraud, uh, perform diagnostics, or using a regression type of, a, of an application where you try to forecast something for the future, or make predictions about the future, or, or gain some insights about uh, data that you that you have available to you. On the left of this figure is unsupervised learning. Uh, it's not quite used as much, perhaps, as supervised learning. And this type of, of learning is, is appropriate when you don't have a labeled data set. So it, it consists of a couple of different areas, reducing dimensionality to discover a structure, or clustering uh, data into different clusters, um, using like k-means or other clustering mechanisms for recommender systems or segmenting uh, customers into different spaces. So on the bottom of this chart for machine learning is uh, really the part that we're going to spend uh, this course on. It's uh, reinforcement learning, and it's a little bit different than the other two. It's in a way, it's you know, it's kind of a combination of supervised and unsupervised learning. Uh, it's unsupervised from the standpoint that the agent doesn't uh, really have a, a full knowledge of the environment that it's working with. Uh, so it's kind of unsupervised in that aspect, but it kind of shares some things with supervised learning because uh, the agent does have an environment that it interacts with, and step by step as it explores that environment, it kind of learns, uh, it gets to learn about the environment, and in a way, uh, the states that it that it receives it can kind of, in a way, be considered labels for the, the information that it's learning. But it really is its own different area. It's uh, the, the techniques that we use, the software algorithms that are applied are, are totally different than, than the other supervised and unsupervised learning. Except that um, you know this particular type of reinforcement learning that we're concentrating on is deep reinforcement learning, and uh, that comes from the fact that uh, most of the 
algorithms that we use are going to be using uh, deep neural networks to perform um, a lot of the optimization and uh, store the and store the knowledge that uh, is gained in interacting with the environment. So reinforcement learning, uh, what type of domains is it used for? Um, I would say uh, mostly things that had to do with uh, with planning, navigating, like robot navigation, controlling controlling robots, controlling industrial processes. Uh, it's being used a lot in game AI. I think uh, a, a lot of uh, you might have some interest in that of of learning, having a reinforcement reinforcement learning algorithm working in the background to uh, give some uh, uh, control to characters so that they do reasonable things in the situations that they find themselves in, and um, so it's a it's a really a a, a growing domain. Uh, it's an area where it's gotten a lot of em emphasis recently. You probably heard in the news um, a lot of uh, news about things like uh, AlphaGo and uh, playing a, a Go at, at superhuman level and discovering new strategies that didn't uh, that humans hadn't really known about before. So uh, it's really uh, an interesting field, and I'm, I'm glad you're all here to uh, to learn about it. So, uh, what are the basics of reinforcement learning? Uh, first of all, it's uh, you can think of it as uh, learning what to do uh, when you don't necessarily initially know um, the entire environment, uh, but you have to map those situations that you encounter and choose appropriate actions in that environment uh, to maximize a reward signal. And those are all important things. The reward signal is key. Uh, the, the environment uh, will tell you, will give you a reward as the agent uh, takes certain actions. And as the agent takes those actions and gets that reward, it uses that reward to uh, understand better what the environment is and what actions are better than other actions and uh, to come up with an optimal policy for uh, navigating the environment. Uh, it's important to know that uh, at first, uh, the learner is not told what actions to take. The learner has to discover uh, those actions and figure out what's good and what is, is not so good by uh, exploring the environment and using that experience to uh, guide uh, the understanding of the environment and, 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 and the algorithms will help then to select the appropriate actions uh, as an optimal policy to navigate the environment. It's also important to know that uh, the actions that you have or that the agent has uh, doesn't just uh, affect the immediate uh, reward, but it's important to know that those rewards can, can uh, affect future things, future activities. And in a way, it's kind of the past activity. So a lot of times the reward that you get far in the future uh, will be propagated back to the network to uh, to provide that reward uh, at a state earlier in time. And something that may not have been that great immediately might lead to some great payoff in the future. And so uh, we have a, the concept of a discounted reward that uh, is, is, is used to really show what the value of a particular state or the, a particular action might be in that state. So uh, a couple distinguishing features of reinforcement learning. Uh, the first one is trial and error search, where initially the agent knows nothing about the environment and has to try different things, experience the environment to understand uh, what's good and what's bad. Uh, you start with significant uncertainty, and then over time, uh, gain more and more knowledge about the environment. And the second thing, as I mentioned uh, just in the previous slide, is delayed reward, and we express that as value. That's a discounted reward uh, based on uh, things that might happen in the future that uh, would impact the present. Now, since you don't know, since the agent doesn't know a lot about the environment initially, um, there's this concept uh, that, that you'll see throughout this entire course is the exploration exploitation trade-off. Uh, since you don't know much initially, the agent has to explore the environment. And then as the agent has done a lot of exploration, uh, as time goes on, as episodes uh, after episode uh, pile up and accumulate, the agent needs to start transitioning from exploration to exploitation. And that means to, to take advantage of what it's learned and uh, gain the most reward in the, in the situations that it finds itself in. So it, uh, the, the last key thing here is that the agent uh, has to be able to sense the state of the environment. There has to be an interaction between the environment and the agent for the agent to uh, get that knowledge uh, of the current state that the environment's in and what the reward is associated with that state and those actions that it has taken. So here's a couple examples. I, I kind of talked a little bit about these on uh, the overview slide for uh, for machine learning, but for reinforcement learning, uh, this first one, playing games. Um, there's a famous paper in Nature. Uh, I think it was about four or five years ago. This sort of broke open this whole field of reinforcement learning or deep reinforcement learning. Uh, 
the uh, the, uh, the researchers at, it was from uh, DeepMind, I believe they were. Um, Min was one of the, the key uh, guys on this team. And uh, they found that they could program a deep reinforcement learning system to actually play Atari video games uh, and do so just from looking at the pixel images on the screen and, and then taking actions, exploring those environments, and essentially learning to play the game without any programming from, uh, by a human. And, and the same setup that they had, the same general architecture uh, was applied to over 50 different video games and it learned to play all of them, many, many of them at superhuman performance levels. Uh, that same technique then was, was extended to uh, build a chess program that uh, was a deep reinforcement learning chess program that also uh, played it at uh, superhuman performance. In fact, it's the, uh, the strongest chess program uh, in the world right now. Uh, the interesting thing about this, there have been books that have been written uh, now that, that examine some of the games that were played and the strategies that were taken. Uh, and it's actually impacting how humans play the game of chess today. And a similar thing's happening with Go, a, a game that we thought would never be solved by computers for many, many years. Uh, deep reinforcement learning recently, uh, it was in the news, I think last year, maybe the year before, uh, where the same group at uh, uh, DeepMind was able to uh, program uh, a deep reinforcement agent to play Go at uh, an amazing level, beating the best uh, human players. Very common applications of deep reinforcement learning are robots, controlling robots, uh, learning how to, uh, from, ex from just examples uh, of uh, uh, even, even just watching a video screen of the robot doing something and then continually experimenting in order to figure out how to accomplish some task. Uh, Self-driving vehicles. Um, there's a lot of work being done right now in, in putting deep reinforcement algorithms into automobiles to let them uh, drive uh, on the roads uh, automated without, without human control. Uh, there was a, a paper recently about controlling stoplights where they, uh, researchers have put together a deep reinforcement learning algorithm to uh, take the video from a stoplight cameras at different intersections and uh, in greatly improve uh, the traffic throughput through all those intersections just based on trying different uh, steps of uh, making the lights go red and green and uh, seeing how that impacted the traffic and basically learning on its own to uh, come up with an algorithm that's better than what they had been programmed with by a human. And the last example here is industrial control. Uh, Google's actually applied this in their data centers for uh, controlling the air conditioning system in the data centers. And their algorithm using deep reinforcement learning, I, I think they said it was like 40% uh, energy saving compared to how uh, those systems were controlled previously. So it's uh, a pretty amazing uh, application of the technology. So let's move on to uh, some of the basics uh, of uh, reinforcement learning. And, and uh, this is the uh, the Markov decision process. If you're not already familiar with this process, you will be very familiar with it by the end of the course. Uh, this particular figure from our textbook, Sutton and Barto, is probably the most important figure in, in the entire book. Um, if you understand this figure and understand how, it, how uh, the agent interacts with the environment, uh, it's really key to understanding every algorithm presented. So there's, there's two key things here. Uh, one is the agent and one is the environment. They interact with each other. And the agent takes some action uh, that gets passed to the environment. The environment analyzes that action and it determines uh, what state the environment will transition to and what reward uh, should be provided for that action. That, that state and that reward are then passed back to the agent. The agent then goes in this uh, loop to take another step, uh, examines the current state it's in, the reward that it got for being in that state, and chooses another action to take. That process repeats over and over. Uh, and the agent is fully in control in the sense that the agent chooses the actions and then the environment analyzes those actions, determines what happens uh, to the, where the agent goes in the environment. And, uh, and through those actions, the agent learns to understand the environment and then learns how to exploit the environment to get the most reward. So uh, really, really understand this figure, uh, spend some time with it, uh, refer back to it with every, until uh, it just becomes ingrained. So with, with every algorithm that you look at, um, Look at this uh, this figure of the Markov decision process and uh, and see how it applies to that algorithm. So I kind of already mentioned these key terms, but uh, every deep reinforcement learning uh, algorithm starts with an agent. Uh, this is the uh, the learner for the environment. It's the uh, it's the entity that is trying to understand the environment and to gain a reward from that environment. Uh, the agent can take different actions. Those are the the lowercase a's. Uh, the environment is the uh, uh, 
the description of the world that the agent is uh, interacting with. Um, the state is the current situation that's returned by the environment. This could be like, uh, for example, in a, uh, uh, say, a, a automated driving application, the, the state could be the current speed the car is in, uh, where it's at in the lane, uh, what the other traffic is around um, the car, uh, maybe uh, an estimate of all those cars that are ahead of the, the current automobile, uh, what the current time before there might be a collision with one of those. So all, all that state information is fed back to the agent uh, to tell it like what the current situation is, where it finds itself in the environment. And then the reward is uh, the, the goodness or badness of, of that state that, that you're currently in. Okay, another key term, policy. Um, this is sort of uh, something a little bit new if you haven't done reinforcement learning before, but the policy is something you'll see everywhere. And a lot of the discussions that we'll have uh, throughout this course is, is talking about different kinds of policies. And, and a policy is simply the strategy that the agent's going to follow uh, to determine what action to take based on the current state that it finds itself in. Uh, there can be different policies. Uh, you can have a random policy where you randomly uh, uh, take different actions. Uh, you can have what's called a greedy policy, which is you examine all the, pro the actions available to you in the current state and choose the one that you think is, act is going to give you the best reward. Um, and then you could have a stochastic policy where you may choose to uh, make your choice of rewards not based on just the most, most the best reward, but a distribution of, of, of probabilities uh, of taking different, different actions on, on a sort of random basis. Okay, uh, value is an interesting term. Uh, value is the expected long-term uh, of value of a state. So um, this is the, uh, the discounted value of all the future rewards that you might get for being in that state. And uh, a second related value is called the Q value or the action value. And you'll see these used in, in different discussions throughout the book. Uh, sometimes you'll be looking at the value, the B value, and that's just looking at the current state. Sometimes the algorithm will look at the, uh, the action value, which means consider both the state uh, and the action in order to determine uh, the value uh, of a particular action. Okay, so as an example, let's look at uh, one of the uh, sort of key initial uh, descriptions of, uh, of this environment process we just talked about. Uh, it's, a, it's a thing called a K-armed bandit, and it's a good demonstration of some of the key principles of, of reinforcement learning. Uh, it's not a deep reinforcement learning algorithm. I guess maybe you could employ a deep uh, algorithm to go with it, but uh, it, it, it's really uh, an excellent example of the epsilon greedy algorithm, which is also something that, that you'll see uh, used throughout this course. Uh, just about every algorithm that you uh, will use uh, has some form of epsilon greedy embedded in it. And so it's important to understand what that is, what it means, and uh, these, these K-arm bandits examples uh, or a good way to understand that uh, epsilon greedy algorithm. So what is a K-armed bandit? Uh, a bandit, uh, one-armed bandit is a slot machine from Las Vegas. Uh, you might remember seeing pictures of these in the old days, they actually had an uh, arm on it that you'd pull the arm down. And uh, today, uh, you know, they're all video games. They, they uh, just have buttons on them and uh, the, the, uh, the arms aren't really there anymore. But uh, in the old days, you pulled the arm of the bandit uh, the uh, little random things would uh, turn and then uh, you would get a reward. And each time uh, you put your quarter in the slot, uh, you get another chance to pull the arm and, and get another return. So in the K-arm bandits, uh, there's uh, a set of bandits, K number of them. And in this example, I think uh, I have come up, there's about 10 different ones. And uh, each one of these K-arm bandits, uh, each one of these armed bandits uh, has a different uh, return and the return is expressed as a Gaussian distribution. So there's a, a mean and a variance and each each machine, each bandit has a different uh, mean return and has a different variance. So it varies from machine to machine. And the goal uh, for the bandit, uh, for the agent is to uh, maximize the return uh, first by exploring the environment and then identify the best machines in the environment and then exploit those machines uh, to get the best payoff that, that it can get. So here's a picture of some uh, one-armed bandits on the left. And for the for this example, uh, here are these 10 uh, uh, example distributions that I showed you. So there's only a single state in this particular uh, environment. 
Uh, but that state can have 10 different actions and the actions um, amount to choosing which of the uh, 10 different arms to be pulled. Uh, each each uh, arm or each bandit has a different mean and a different standard deviation. So as you can see, uh, pulling any one of these arms, uh, you could get any return from minus three to three in this example. Uh, uh, let's take the one uh, for action five. You know, the average return uh, is, is five for that one. It shows that it doesn't really line up with the uh, axis on the left, but uh, the average return for that one is a, is a five. But you can see that you know any particular time you pull that, you end up you could end up getting something that's zero, or you might get something that's ten. You could get anything along that range. Uh, the most common or the most probable value would be five, but uh, you could pull anything. So, you know, if if if, uh, if you took the action to say, let me just uh, pull each arm, and then after that, I'll I'll choose the arm that gave me the best return, and and keep pulling that every time. Uh, it's possible that when you pulled arm six, for example, um, you might have uh, had a uh, a return that was uh, was very high, even though the average return is is very low for this for this one. And I, actually, I just noticed that these uh, these these parenthetical uh, values are not uh, are not the return values uh, that does match up with the axis on the left. That's just the number of the uh, of the action as an identifier there. So so anyway, uh, you know, if you pulled all these, it's possible that the the the, uh, the sixth bandit might have given you actually the highest return. You know, it's, it's something that could have happened in that one pull. Uh, and you don't want to then choose that bandit from then on because then you would have lower reward than if you had uh, chosen some other bandit to be the one you wanted to exploit. So the the uh, the idea here is what what algorithm can you use to to explore this environment and determine uh, which one of these bandits is the best one to use and and get the most reward over time. So this is kind of a strange problem. I mean, who has a, uh, you know, it's kind of a made up problem in the sense that uh, we don't have these uh, lined up machines of uh, different uh, returns to explore and, and get payoff from. But there are uh, real world examples that uh, that are very similar to this, this uh, concept. Uh, one of them is a clinical trial where you might have a, a, a lot of different patients and you have two different uh, treatments that you might apply and you don't know which of those two treatments might be the best. So you have to try with all these different patients and try different treatments, different ones, identify which one really works the best and then uh, exploit that by uh, using that particular treatment or that particular prescription for the entire population once you've identified uh, what, what the best effect was, what the best uh, treatment might be. Another example is uh, uh, designing a uh, financial portfolio, uh, what investments should be made at any particular point in time. There's a wide choice of investment opportunities. There's a lot of things that impact uh, the payoff of those different investments. And uh, this is a good example of a time variant uh, example because over time, uh, the environment changes. It's not static, it's not time environment. Uh, this, this particular uh, world of investment, every day, different news, uh, different uh, effects in the economy, different political actions, different things that impact the world. Uh, they change the environment and, and the, uh, the agent if you have an agent that's trying to exploit that environment, it would have to change with the environment. So uh, it points out that uh, you don't wanna have a static policy necessarily. You wanna be able to continue to explore uh, all throughout time in order as you, at the same time that you're exploiting the environment, you wanna continue to explore the environment. And, uh, and online advertising uh, is another example. Um, you, you might uh, have uh, uh, like A-B testing different uh, different uh, advertisements that you might want to put in front of people and find out which one gives the best payoff. This is another one that can be time variant. You know, over time, people's people's uh, uh, choices might vary. Uh, they might decide uh, on, uh, by different uh, types of fashion or whatever that uh, things change. And, and so the agent would have to be able to adjust to that. So now let's discuss this key concept, uh, exploration, exploitation trade-off. So the agent, uh, as we said, it seeks to uh, achieve a goal and, and get the most reward, but uh, it has to explore the environment before it can exploit the environment. And uh, if if the agent only explores, then it spends all its time, uh, you know, equally exploring all the different alternatives and uh, spending a lot of time getting small or negative reward when it could have spent that time uh, getting better reward. So that's that's not necessarily a good plan all the time. Uh, at the same time. Uh, exploiting the environment all the time and just choosing the single action that you think is best at every point in time, uh, that's not also a good 
uh, strategy because then if you have a faulty understanding of the environment, uh, you may be uh, stuck in a state that you think is the best state when in fact other states might be better. So the point is that uh, neither one of those strategies, exploring or exploiting, are the best uh, exclusively. You have to, there has to be a method of, of, uh, of, of using both of them and using them together in a way that uh, lets the agent uh, do some exploration and do some exploitation. So the, the uh, method that's, that's uh, used all throughout deep, reinforcement, deep reinforcement learning uh, is called Epsilon Greedy. And uh, this is a good opportunity to uh, really introduce that method. Another thing you'll see, uh, I should point out, uh, all through this uh, course is something that's called the greedy, uh, the greedy method. If you ever hear uh, some say, take the greedy choice, that's uh, reinforcement learning uh, terminology to say, take the very best choice that you know of at the current time for the situation that you find yourself in. Uh, and when I say you, I, I mean the agent. So the, the greedy choice for the agent is the, uh, is the best action in, in the state that it's in. Now, the, the greedy action is not always the best action, but it's the, it is the uh, one that gives the most uh, return uh, as far as you know right now at that point in time. So the, uh, a naive greedy method uh, would be what I, what I mentioned initially. Um, you know, I just go through and uh, sample all of the, uh, the, the handles on the different machines, uh, record what you get in that initial sample, and then totally uh, exploit the one uh, that gave the best return. Uh, but due to the randomness of the rewards, uh, that initial choice uh, might be less than ideal. So uh, the epsilon greedy algorithm is a way to uh, have a, an algorithm that over time uh, has, a, has an uh, exploration, exploitation uh, uh, trade-off. And it, uh, it is built so that initially the agent is encouraged to do a lot of exploration. And then later on, uh, in later episodes, it's encouraged to do more exploitation and less uh, exploration. So the way that that's done is with a parameter that has been uh, labeled epsilon. And that epsilon parameter, uh, pretty much whenever you see epsilon throughout this course, uh, it, it applies to uh, this uh, epsilon greedy algorithm. And epsilon uh, varies from 0 to 1. Um, if, uh, if epsilon is one, it means explore totally. And it take random choices, uh, ignore what the very best choice you think is, and just take a random choice. If uh, epsilon is zero, uh, that means don't do any exploration and spend all of your time exploiting the very best choice and don't choose the best option at any point in time. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, if, if epsilon is, is a half, like on the right side of this figure, uh, then with probability 0.5, uh, you would uh, toss a coin, and uh, if the coin came up heads, you would choose to explore. If it came up tails, uh, you would choose to exploit. Uh, and if you explored, you'd take a random action. If you exploit, you would take a look at what the best action is and take that, that greedy action. Now, the key thing is that uh, the, way, the way an agent can really take advantage of this is by starting off with epsilon being 1.0 uh, and totally explore the environment, and then over time, slowly reduce epsilon. And every time the epsilon gets reduced, uh, the agent will spend less time exploring and more time exploiting. And if you reduce it all the way to zero, uh, at that point, you, know, you stopped exploring and you're using the optimal policy to always uh, move, your, move through the environment using the optimal policy, choosing the best action uh, at each point in time. So here's the algorithm. Um, I'd like to just kind of go over this algorithm as an example uh, of how the pseudocode is structured in our book, the Sutton and Bartow book. Uh, every one of the algorithms that are discussed, and there's uh, many of them, I don't know the exact number, but there's probably on the order of 100 different algorithms, and every one of them has a little box like this that sort of describes um, what the algorithm is. And I'll have to tell you, uh, the hardest part of following uh, these uh, these pseudocode descriptions is really understanding the terminology. So it's important whenever you see one of these to really uh, make sure that you understand uh, what the different terms are. Uh, the pseudocode has abbreviations for everything. Uh, usually surrounding the pseudocode will be uh, some paragraphs that describe uh, what the different uh, parameters are that's in the algorithm. So in this uh, simple banded algorithm, and again, this is uh, this is from the Bartow and Sutton, Sutton and Bartow book, uh, the, the key uh, terms I have listed on the left there. Uh, capital A uh, is the uh, identifier for the bandit. Um, 
and there, that, in this particular example I gave uh, range from one to 10, but there could be any number uh, in, the, in the general algorithm, there's K of these different bandits. So the, the, the capital A identifies which uh, of the uh, bandits are, are going to be selected, uh, what action is going to be taken essentially. The capital R is the short-term reward. Uh, that's the reward that the uh, agent receives for making that one poll. The Q value is the sum of all rewards received over time. So while, while the R value is uh, the reward for one poll, the Q value is sort of the value of that state or the value of that, uh, that action in this case. Uh, since it's a Q value, uh, if you remember back original discussions, there's V values and Q values, and, and V just depended on the state. Uh, Q values depend on the state and the action. Uh, in, in this uh, epsilon greedy uh, example that we're looking at here, there's actually just a single state. It's the state of the, uh, the 10 bandits, and the action is the uh, one of uh, 10 different choices, or one of K different choices in this case that you can, you can choose. So since you're uh, basing the, the uh, long-term uh, value on the action, uh, this is termed a, a Q value type of problem, and so uh, the, the Q here is used as the, the symbology. Uh, EPS is epsilon uh, that controls the uh, the trade-off between uh, exploration and exploitation, as we as we talked about. Uh, and uh, you pick in in some case you might just pick an epsilon. You, you might say epsilon is going to be 0.3 and it's frozen, or uh, a more sophisticated algorithm uh, might uh, change epsilon over time and uh, reduce it from uh, 1.0 at the beginning to something smaller as episodes increase. Uh, index A is uh, just the uh, the trial index. Uh, it ranges from one to K in this example. And this capital N of A, you'll see this in a lot of the algorithms. Uh, this is the number of times that that particular action was taken uh, in that state. And again, here in this uh, this K bandit uh, problem, we only have a single state. So a lot of times uh, N will be, uh, if, if you're doing Q values, N will be indexed uh, by state and action. Uh, here it's just by action because we just have a single state. And Q uh, of A, Q with A in parentheses there, that's the average reward received when pulling bandit A. So that's the thing that's uh, really the most important uh, to, thing to know for the agent. Um, and that is for all the different agents, all, I mean, all of the different actions uh, I could take, all the different bandit arms I could pull, uh, what is the current uh, estimated average reward I think I will receive if I, if I pull that particular arm? So with that uh, knowledge of the nomenclature, let's look at the algorithm itself. Uh, so it starts by initializing um, for all uh, A from 1 to K, it initializes all the Q values to zero and all the number of times that a state's uh, action has been taken uh, to zero also. Uh, once that initialization is complete, um, the algorithm goes into a loop. And the first thing it's going to do uh, is uh, choose an action. And the actions are uh, one of two things. It can either take a random action with probability epsilon. So uh, you basically take a random draw. Uh, and if the uh, value that you get is, uh, is less than or equal to epsilon, you would take the random action. If it's uh, less than or equal to epsilon, then you would choose the, uh, the, other, uh, the other action, um, in, in which case, in this case, you, you would choose the greedy action uh, with probability one minus epsilon. And that greedy action uh, simply is look at all of the values that I know, uh, all the Q values for all the potential actions, uh, and take the one that is, mo is maximum. So that's how you identify action for this particular uh, trip through the loop. Uh, once the action is taken, then the, the environment will, will produce a reward for that action. Uh, the, the, uh, Environment will pull the arm of the bandit, in this case, uh, the bandit that you chose, and it'll pick uh, a, a, a random point along that distribution and return to you a reward. And that reward here is just the, uh, the Gaussian uh, value that you got for whatever uh, uh, random uh, value was used as the index for it. Uh, after you've gotten the reward, uh, then it's time to make some updates. Uh, you're updating two things here. One is you've now visited this, uh, this Bandit, this one particular, you've taken this one particular action uh, an additional time from what you had done before. So you increment the counter for that to, so you can keep track of how many times you've, you've uh, used that action. And then uh, for that particular bandit, uh, you update the Q value. Uh, the Q value is updated. In this uh, You'll find out uh, a little bit later in the course. Uh, there's a, a, 
set of algorithms called temporal difference equations. And uh, this, this update you're doing here is a temporal difference update. Uh, you're basically taking the previous value that you knew about Q uh, and you're comparing it to the reward that you got. So the reward uh, minus what you thought the value was is a kind of an error signal, a difference between uh, what you thought that environment would produce and what it actually produced. And then you divide that reward signal by uh, an alpha term. And in this case, alpha is the uh, number of times you pulled that arm. So essentially, if you pulled this arm uh, many times in the past, you're going to make a small adjustment to what you think the, the new value should be. Uh, if you haven't pulled it many times in the past, then uh, you're going to really weight uh, the reward you got more heavily. So as you go through this process, uh, the agent uh, will learn about the environment. Uh, it will uh, make choices in the environment, and it will exploit those choices to uh, get the most reward that it can. OK, so I hope that's clear. Uh, again, uh, the main reason for going through this example uh, was twofold. One, uh, really to introduce this concept of these uh, the pseudocode that's used throughout uh, the textbook, and also to uh, uh, reinforce uh, some of the uh, key terminology that's used. And this this particular example just has you know one set of terms. Some of these terms you'll see used in other examples, uh, and then new terms will appear depending on what the algorithm is. So again, um, uh, you should really study these uh, the pseudocode when it, when uh, you're uh, given a particular algorithm because it'll give you the insight to really know the details of what actually happens inside that algorithm. So um, that's really all I had for you today. Uh, in summary, uh, we talked about reinforcement learning, uh, where reinforcement learning lies in the general AI or machine learning landscape compared to the other things that you might be more familiar with, um, like uh, 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 labeled supervised learning or unlabeled uh, unsupervised learning. Uh, this is sort of a third area, a third uh, general area in uh, in that machine learning uh, domain. Uh, we also discussed uh, the Markov decision process, uh, really the key, most important uh, uh, figure in the book, the most important thing to understand throughout this course. So if you understand the Markov decision process, uh, that's that whole process is uh, central to everything that's done in, in uh, reinforcement learning. And that MDP process, uh, it has the agent, the environment, um, the agent uh, senses what state it's in, what reward it's gotten for being in that state. And then uh, it takes an action. That action is passed to the environment. Uh, the environment analyzes that reward, uh, determines what state the, uh, the agent should transition to and what reward it should get for transitioning to that state. And then I uh, presented uh, multi-armed bandits as a, uh, uh, just as an example of, uh, of of some of the algorithms and uh, how the pseudocode works. So that's all I had for you today. Uh, I hope you found it interesting. Um, it's really a basic introduction to, uh, deep, reinfo to deep reinforcement learning. And uh, we'll do uh, one of these webinars each week. Uh, if anyone has questions about what we talked about, um, I would uh, be happy to answer the questions. Uh, the easiest way to do that is probably just post a question in our Slack channel. Yeah, you should be familiar with that channel. We have uh, a channel for our, our, our class, of our little group of 19 students. So we can interact together over that channel. Um, post a question there. Be glad to address it. Uh, until then, I'll talk to you next week. Bye.